FY22 earnings conference call of Godrej Consumer Products Limited hosted by ICICI Securities. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anikit Sethi from ICICI Securities Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, Steven. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. At ISEC, it's our pleasure to host the senior management team of Godrej Consumer Products Limited for their 4Q FI22 earnings call. I will hand it over to Mr. Pratik Dantara for the future proceedings. Thank you and over to you, Pratik. Thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome to the conference call. We will be covering this evening the results for the quarter ended 31st March 2022. On the call with me from GCPL is Ms. Mr. Bhagavad Ridge, Executive Chairperson, Sudhir Sitapati, Managing Director and CEO, and Tanisha, CFO. We'll start with Sudhir talking about our performance. Over to you. Thanks, Pratik. Uh, Good evening, everyone. I hope you and your families are safe and healthy, and thank you for joining us on the call today. I'll first start with an update of our quarterly performance. We've had a weak quarter in Q4 FY22 with a few silver linings. While our overall sales grew by 7% and we achieved double-digit sales growth for the year, the growth within the quarter was driven entirely by pricing. Our overall EBITDA without an inventory theft in South Africa de-grew by 9%, driven by unprecedented global commodity inflation and scale leverage, deleverage in Indonesia. Fact without exception declined by 4%. Our core geography of India grew top line at 9% with a two-year CAGR of 21%. While the sales was largely driven by pricing and UVG was down by 3%, on a two-year CAGR basis, UVG grew by 12%, and on a three-year basis, it grew by about 2%. The silver lining in India, however, has been that EBITDA grew by 14% with EBITDA margins expanding by 100 BPS. This points to our ability to take measured price hikes to counter inflation. However, the recent inflation brought about by the Ukraine crisis will hit our PNL majorly only in Q1, and we again expect a relatively sharp drop for this quarter. Indonesia delivered a particularly weak performance with sales declining at 15%, and operating EBITDA at minus 48. This has been driven by tough market conditions, the sharp fall in COVID-19 related categories, and a big reduction in our inventory in modern trade and distributors. Poor sales compounded by the cost inflation and a 200 BPS investment in ATL, which we continued despite the gross margin falls, has meant that the EBITDA drop has been precipitous. The silver lining here is that there are early signs of the Indonesian market recovering. For instance, our offtake growth without Sanitar, our COVID portfolio and accounts where we get data is much better than primaries and has started to grow. With our strong market position, media increases resulting in recent share gains and our determination to reduce our trade pipelines, we expect things to start improving from Q3 FY23. Uh, both LATAM and Africa witnessed strong growth, with LATAM growing upwards of 30% and Africa growing in the mid-teens. Africa, however, had very poor margins due to an unfortunate theft of inventory in South Africa. The growth flywheel in Africa has started to move, but we need to simplify our business and significantly strengthen governance and controls to prevent a recurrence of this unfortunate event. LATAM has performed extremely well on both top line and bottom line. Our pre-hyperinflation EBITDA has now crossed 20%, and we generate close to 80 crores of cash in this business in FY22. In terms of categories, while market growth continues under pressure, market shares are broadly good, and there's nothing new to report. Our prognosis for FY23 remains broadly unchanged from what I spoke to you last quarter. We anticipate double-digit top-line growth with low single-digit volume growth. Bottom line is hard to predict, but if costs moderate to 6,000 MYR per palm oil, about 7 to 8% lower than where they are today, and $100 for crude, 
we should see some margin expansion, especially in the second half of the year. Our personal view, however, is that palm oil may moderate even further, and that is generally good news for us. Our game plan is to grow category development driven by relevant access and marketing investments and funded by a digitally enabled simplification of our organization. We have a slew of category developments in Q1, which we believe will dramatically build relevance of our categories. A few that we've launched in April and May are that in hair color, we are the market leaders with more than one fourth of the market. In India, more than half the category operates between 10 and 15 rupees. On, in April, we launched Godrej Expert Rich Cream at 15 rupees to drive penetration of the creme format by recruiting the early gray consumer living in middle and rural India and accelerating new trials with first-time users. We are backing this with increased media investment, large-scale visibility, and leveraging our distribution reach. Another big initiative that we have taken is in household insecticide, where we have dropped the price of Jumbo Fast Card from 15 rupees to 10 rupees to drive recruitment in the category, as nearly a third of new trials are entering the category through incense sticks. Again, we are backing this with media investments and on-ground activations. We will be happy to share more of our category development initiatives in Q1 because some of them will only happen in June and July in our next meeting. Our journey on simplification is another silver lining and is making good progress. And the category that we created in Q3 FY22 is yielding early results. Our cost to serve, which is a measure that we look at, which is total costs minus material costs minus working media, which Material costs in working media are what we serve. Everything else is a cost to serve. Is down by 250 BPS in Q4. When costs stabilize, this will give us significant fuel for growth and digital transformation. But investments are only part of the story in digital transformation. People and culture are more important. And towards that, we are making two senior appointments of people with significant experience in digital transformation. Akhil Chandra, business head for Indonesia and ASEAN, has decided to pursue an opportunity outside Goldrich. Rajesh Seturaman will be joining us to take over from Akhil as the CEO of ASEAN from July 1st. Rajesh has spent 21 years as, at HUL and Unilever, leading teams across categories and divisions in South Asia and Africa to deliver significant value for the business. In his previous role, he led Unilever's execution of its largest digital transformation program across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. We are also appointing Vijay Kannan as the head of business transformation and digital for GCPL. Vijay will report to me and serve on the Global Management Committee. He is currently the Global Chief Information Digital Officer of Shell's $20 billion lubricants business and has had past experience as HUL's IT head and prior to that in Asian paints. Vijay's brief is simple. If we were a digital first company, how would we dramatically look at reducing our cost to serve? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Avnish Roy from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Sudhir. Uh, thanks. Uh, my first question is on uh, hair dye pricing in India. So we have seen uh, uh, the creme uh, hair color pricing in India remain in that 25 to 30 rupees for many years in India. And now we have come out with the disruptive pricing at INR 15. So two, three questions here. Uh, one is how do you drive uh, average revenue per user uh, per Situation here. Last five years, I have not seen uh, much movement here. Second is how do you take care of cannibalization from the INR 15 product? And third is competitive intensity and parlor presence remains a key uh, work in progress. So, if you could uh, discuss that also. Thanks. 
Yeah, Abhish, thanks for that question. I think uh, there are two, three things. One is, you know, the penetration of the hair cream category is sub 20% in India. And as I said in the last two meetings, one of our jobs is to drive market development. And category after category, you will see that access has been a key driver of category penetration. So I would say that uh, generally what we observe when we uh, bring access into a category is penetration goes up pretty exponentially and frequency of use also goes up in general. So I, I'm anticipating both of these happening. There is a pretty clear use case that we discovered for this, which is, you know, we are communicating it, which is the first silver hair or touch up. There are a lot of consumers who have just got early silver hair or a short crop of hair like men, for whom we were anyway going to see uh, the 30 rupee pack had, uh, you know, was being used two times. So we feel that there's a unique case. In general, then, you know, I don't know if there will, there might be some cannibalization of niche, but these are fast growing markets. And I anticipate that the 30 rupee product will continue to grow, albeit at a slightly slower pace. And uh, we hope that the access that we create into the category will will drive a lot of growth. I mean, to, to your point on on salons and so on and so forth, we have an excellent professional business that is growing really well, and we target uh, salons in B and C. So we're covering our base, and that's one of our fastest growing parts of our business. It's a small part, but growing really fast. But the opportunity in India is enormous uh, for a category like this to go for many years, and I hope this move will, will, will reignite growth in the category. Sure, that's useful. Uh, my second and last question is on the Africa business margins. Uh, if you could quantify uh, the impact from inventory, pinsurage, and uh, what are the checks and balances you are ensuring that uh, it doesn't stay recur in South Africa or any other uh, international geography? Uh, and uh, how do you see uh, Africa margins in the in the near term and medium term, because my sense is uh, this item will not recover. Uh, recur, it's a one-off. But how do you see in the in the next two three quarters uh, time horizon? Hey, Abhinesh, this is Samir here. Yes, I think a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, we have put in, or we will, I mean, you know, kind of put in stronger you know, checks and balances, including say something like third-party physical verification happening, you know, every quarter, as well as work on strengthening both our business processes as well as internal control to avoid this recurrence in future. Um, so that, you know, something like this doesn't recur, you know, again. In terms of margins, uh, just to give you a bridge, I mean, if you look at the overall margins, including this pilferage, um, the drop is actually close to around 900 basis points. 300 bits is because of pilferage, or maybe 350 bits is because of pilferage. 250 bits is because of upfront marketing and group to market initiatives. In some of the countries where growth has been, I would say, you know, quite strong, and that's something which we remain extremely confident of, uh, even in the coming quarters and years. Um, the rest, I would say, 300, 350 basis points will be because of lag between increase in input prices and then consumer prices, which we will mitigate through price increase. To answer your question, I, I think there should not be, you know, margin deterioration in Africa, at least on a full year basis uh, in FY23. If any, I mean, we should continue to be on the trajectory of uh, gradual, you know, margin expansion on a YOY basis, uh, even in FY23. I mean, Amish, despite this, you know, we have kind of improved our margins in FY22 and a combination, I mean, it's a difficult time even there because of input prices, but a combination of the increasing salience of FMCG and the growth leverage that we're getting on our businesses because they're growing fast, we expect broadly kind of moderate margin improvement to continue on the second, in the, in the, in the medium to long term. Okay, that's uh, very useful. That's all for my side. Thanks. Thanks, Amish. Thank you. The next question is from the lineup, Percy Pantaki from IFL. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, just wanted to understand uh, some of your uh, initiatives. So this uh, uh, CREM, which is launched at 15, uh, what is the difference uh, between that and the basic product you have at uh, 30, 35? Is it just a, a, a lesser quantity of CREM or is the product itself uh, different? No, it's just, it's just a sachet. I mean, it's the same brand, so it's just the principle of a sachet which makes it more accessible uh, for 
a certain cohort of consumers in small town rural India with a short crop of hair. So it's just a okay. So it's just basically a, a, a lesser grammage of the same product. You still have inside two separate sachets which have to be mixed and so on, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I also wanted to understand uh, the, this uh, launch of uh, uh, Goodnight uh, Active Plus at rupees eighty. Again, uh, here also is it a different uh, product from your base product, or uh, is it just a, a, a smaller uh, uh, or lesser grammage uh, product uh, compared to the original one? No, I think Goodnight Active Plus, you know, we always had a flanker brand on Goodnight in some markets. And Goodnight Active uh, is, is just a flanker brand uh, in a few markets that we operate, which we think are price sensitive. So it is not a smaller pack or uh, anything like that. It is, in fact, we were, we were always selling Goodnight Active Plus and, uh, in, in, you know, the, the refill yet. And we just brought back the machine in a few markets where there was demand and where we felt we need a flanker. Okay, but is there any uh, uh, difference uh, in the product itself or it's just basically that those markets cannot sustain the normal price point and therefore you want to sell at a lower price point, but you don't want to ruin the brand and therefore you're launching a flanker? No, the Gold Flash is a value added product compared to the Active Flash. Right, right, understood. So there, there, is, there is a difference in the product uh, itself. Yes. Okay, so uh, just a quick one on uh, the HI uh, strategy. Uh, it seems that the, I mean, while you said you will announce more initiatives, still now whatever initiatives you've done is just basically uh, uh, trying to lower the price points and therefore make the product uh, more accessible. So in your opinion, do you think the major roadblock for uh, growth in this category is that uh, I mean, affordability, is that the major thing? Because we have products like coils, for example, available uh, uh, in a single piece at very, very low uh, price points, and still the penetration is where it is. So do you think that the reason is something else and not uh, affordability or a price point? No, firstly, I, I think that price point is only one part of it. I do think the reason is something else, but. I think in the interest of confidentiality, perhaps we can discuss this in the next analyst meeting. We will do something quite soon here. But I'm only talking about things that we've already done, which is in the public domain. You'll understand that uh, it's not proper for me to publicly talk about what we will do. But we are, look, we're not running away from the issue that we are the market leaders of household insecticide. My own hypothesis is that the category needs development. And often, you know, to speak in general terms, per se, the three things that drive category development are relevance, access, and sampling. So in the case of uh, CREM, that is an example of access. But, you know, across these three dimensions in all the categories, let me give you an example of relevance on something that we have just launched. So again, I can feel free to talk about it. On air, which is our, uh, uh, you know, air freshener business in India and Indonesia, we have recently relaunched AIR with the proposition of when guests come home. That's an example of relevance building, where you're not just saying that the air freshener smells good, you're saying why you should enter the category, which is when guests come home. So that, that's an example of relevance, and, and there'll be plenty of examples of other things that I'll be able to talk to you as and when we launch it in the market. Right. But at this point of time, are you at liberty to discuss uh, which of these three is the most uh, uh, sort of uh, the, the one which you need to address the most uh, in HI or it's uh, too premature to talk about that as well? I think once we do it, we'll talk about it because why talk about something that isn't there, right? I think in general, all these three are important for category development and uh, all of them we will work at even in hair. There's an element there, which is the first silver hair. That is what we're communicating. There is access, and you know, on, on sampling as and when we do it. So we we'll maybe discuss. Maybe we'll discuss HR in a little bit more detail the next quarter on what our game plan is, and maybe we can talk more comprehensively what we're doing once we've done it in the market. Sure. And last question from my side: uh, the uh, uh, illegal incense sticks, uh, which was a huge problem uh, earlier, and then as COVID came, uh, supplies were disrupted, etc. Uh, 
uh, now where does that product stand in terms of market share is it at uh, pre covid levels and i mean if you can give some uh, data on that uh, uh, in terms of market share what it was pre covid how much did it fall to at the trough and what it stands at today so you know yeah it's roughly where it was pre covid uh, it's not growing at the rapid pace that it was growing pre covid at least in the post covid phase but it's still there and it's still growing and it's still frankly you know something that consumers shouldn't do and one of the reasons that what we have done which is to drop the price of fast card from 15 to 10 is so that people at the same price point as incense kick get a safer legal solution right understood so it's at about 12% if uh, memory serves the market share yeah i mean as you mentioned uh, parthi it's close to pre covid levels but yeah it's moving around i think 13 14% this mark okay okay that's all from me thanks and all the best thanks parthi thank you the next question is from the lineup priyam daga from vt capital please go ahead I thank you for taking my question. My question was regarding the raw material side of the insecticide business. So I wanted to understand what kind of raw materials are used in this business. We use active. We use uh, chemicals. Huh? Crude link. I mean indirect material. Yeah, indirect link is crude, but uh, yeah. All right, all right. And my second question was regarding the HI strategy. Have you answered? So sure. Uh, what what are we doing? So I understand that you cannot disclose all all of the guys now, but I wanted to understand how like how are you trying to penetrate deeper into the rural rural areas and how is the demand in the rural side affected? Yeah, I mean again, you know, it's the same answer that I gave Percy, which is I can tell you what I can tell you how we're thinking about it, which is relevance, access, and sampling. An example of access is bringing up the price of jumbo fast car from 15 to 10, of which we're seeing very good results. since we've done it uh, uh, you know a, a month and a half ago and we'll come back to you specifically with what we're doing in these dimensions in the next few months because what we've done in april and may is we've acted on uh, hair color we've made a big intervention in air care largely in the area of relevance and and kind of just increasing the media salience i hope you see some of our advertising both on on pocket which is we use for bathroom but we are also very excited with the living room format which in our indonesian market is our second biggest sku so we believe that that has terrific potential in india without doing any kind of marketing it was anyway growing very fast and now we anticipate with marketing it will grow even faster okay and uh, uh, one more question so i have regarding the indonesia business so what have we done to turn down the business uh, as i as you have mentioned in the call uh, what changes are we having there that the business is uh, turning around see the the business the, the big change that we made from about november onward or december onward was to increase our uh, media support see that is a business which has very high gross margins and high ebitda but relatively low atl and our strategy there is to increase our atl which we have done and as a combination both i think of the indonesian markets also the, the sense i get is that i don't think it's out of the woods but there's certainly a lot of positive news is coming out of indonesia in terms of categories starting to grow again but also in terms of our own market shares we are seeing some movements unfortunately it's going to take you know another two quarters which is this quarter and the next for it to show in terms of sales because the truth is over the last 2 3 years uh, the pipe, the markets also shrank and you know we we built up inventory through our pipelines all right thank you and all the best thank you thank you before we take the next question a reminder to the participants anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 at this time the next question is from the line of alok shah from ambed capital please go ahead yeah hi thanks for the opportunity uh So then, my first question is uh, essentially, uh, you know, what what Percy also asked. So one is on the one is uh, what you mentioned on the relevance, access, uh, etc. On the HI, uh, I also wanted to check with you that are you are you also working on the efficacy? Because you know, while relevance and penetration, to my mind, I mean, you know, consumer is fairly aware of good night as a brand, but uh, maybe you know the the, the you know the incremental recruitment may need some kind of tweaks in terms of the efficacy of the product. so wanted to sh- uh, get your views on the same if, if possible now 
But I, I just prefer to answer if you know if you don't mind. I'm not uh, ducking it or anything. But why don't we discuss the HR strategy? I'm happy to talk about air and hair care because it's in the market now. I mean HR yeah. is also because you know season starts in June really with the monsoon coming in. So a lot of our action will you know is, is just some time away. So perhaps that's a better time to talk rather than you know as a discussion. But I think efficacy is yeah, important. Efficacy is something yeah. that we're always working on, yeah. right? From the active, what active can we register and use, and what product? So I think that's a strength uh, of GCPL. So that's you know, and we're always upgrading our products also. Okay. Okay. Uh, my second question was that uh, you know the presentation mentions about you know uh, getting sharing eighty five percent of the categories in domestic business. Uh, so you know, just want to check that are there pockets of oil and hair color where we could be losing, or or uh, you know, those are small categories uh, where where we may not be gaining share. No, I don't think that is it. I think in liquid liquid detergents, the market is you know we have Easy, which is a, a specialist wash, and we define the market as liquid detergents, and a lot of main wash is entering liquid detergents. So I think it's more mathematical yeah. than anything else. So actually, okay. your spirit is 100%. Okay, got it. And lastly, just a clarification to, to you know, the explanation on the EBITDA margin for Africa. So what I understand is while the reported EBITDA margin is down from 600 to 650 or basis point, uh, overall it is 900, but the 200 or uh, 300 or derivative in theft would not get factored in because it would be exceptional. Is, is that understanding correct? Correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And, uh, Wish you good luck. Thank you. A reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The next question is from the lineup, Abhijit Kundu from Antique Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question was on uh, so, uh, we have seen very intense uh, uh, summers this, are, uh, this time around. Uh, so, uh, which are the categories which will get, uh, uh, I mean, uh, benefited, and uh, how how has been the initial, uh, you know, uh, response? Uh, I mean, uh, how has been the uh, initial, uh, what do you call it, uh, response uh, to the intense summer for you? You are talking of quick summers. Summer, 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 summer has been in terms, so which categories can benefit? Summer, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, it benefits soap. It generally, very, very hot periods are not in favor of household insecticides, but it's anyway, May is not peak season for us, but soap, it will benefit. Okay. And uh, have you seen any benefit of that in, uh, in your uh, EER as well? Or it has been more of, uh, you know, the, the initiatives taken by you that is, that is driving demand because uh, as per our channel, just even EER has done very well. I mean, during April and May. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that you know, look, a lot of the initiatives that we I spoke about, which is basically on hair color on air, we rolled out in April, and I can just say that uh, the initial results are as per expectation. Again, you know, we can talk about results next quarter, but certainly these are powerful uh, category development initiatives, and we're very bullish about how they work for us. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. A reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Trilog from Diamond Asia. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I wanted to have, you know, ask uh, when the initial comment is highly highlighted, you know, that the, even uh, the Q1 seems to be a little constrained in terms of margins. Are you referring to, you know, further sort of, uh, you know, pressure beyond what we already see, or, you know, what, if you can you know, call it to comment on that, that'll be helpful. See, the Ukraine crisis started about three months ago, right, which is in the middle of last quarter, and uh, at that time, last quarter, we were still sitting on older price stocks, so, you know, we've kind of managed debit that now this new inflation will take us a little bit of time to adjust to. So, I mean, I'm not overly worried about it, but certainly, you know, uh, Palm today is quoting at six and a half thousand uh, MYR. 
it had gone to close to seven and a half thousand. Pre pre Ukraine was five and a half thousand. So it's somewhere in between its peak and what it was pre Ukraine. Five and a half itself is a high price. So the new stock that comes in is coming in at higher costs. We will of course judiciously do, and I think that I think you all should have enough confidence given our India margin performance uh, last quarter, despite all the difficulties we faced everywhere else. That that we are able to kind of uh, over a period of time do. Yeah, but uh, and uh, obviously today only that ban has been lifted, so probably that could also bring some relief, you know, hopefully. Okay. And uh, what kind of pricing actions we have taken at the portfolio level uh, to mitigate this uh, inflation so far? No, that will be. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you just look at uh, Q4 trailers, I think the UPG is close to around 12 percent base, right? No, no, I'm talking about, you know, in the in the month of in this quarter we are talking about because what is already been done is done, right? Yeah, so I think incrementally we keep on taking, you know, price increases, especially in personal wash portfolio. It's difficult to aggregate and call out as to what it will be because some has got executed, some will get executed as we speak. Um, the direction in my sense is the UBG will go up in Q1 as compared to uh, what it was in Q4 at overall portfolio level. See, I think in pricing, we can't, I think like all companies, frankly, you know, we have to take judicious price increase. One is we can't shock consumers, so we've got to do it. And two is for speculative costs, we can't price. So we say the speculative cost, like for example, palm at 7,500 and all, we always knew. And now if what you're saying, I didn't know that Indonesia ban has been lifted today. But uh, it will be good news for us. But, you know, in the short term, these things are, we can't react to them in pricing in the short term for very speculative and business continuity. When we have to buy, we have to buy. So I think you just have to look at it in that context. Sure, understood. And just last you note, know, uh, from, a, from a new, you know, kind of pricing accessibility in both the categories that you alluded to, uh, is there, you know, is it fair to assume that those will not be, you know, I mean, gross margin, dilutive or something of that sort? Because obviously penetration is important, but yeah, wanted to hear a thought on that. So, I mean, you know, I think the important thing in this business, as I said, is to drive volume growth. I think we have very healthy EBITDAs in this business and, uh, you know, we will, uh, I mean, our objective is not to drop that. But our objective is primarily to get category volume growth in first. And you must remember that some of these categories, you know, like hair color are not operated anyway very high gross margin. So they're actually, even if they're diluted to the category, they're accretive to the company very often. But I would I would still say that gross margin is super important, but volume growth for us and category development is more important. Sure, thank you. I'll come back in a Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Krishnan Sambamurthy from Motila Loswal Institutional Equities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Sudhir. Uh, as part of your strategy discussion in uh, December, you had highlighted two things. Uh, both are related, so I'll take both of them. One was the relative inability to drive category development, which uh, for which initiatives uh, have been have been taken as you highlighted. The other thing that you had highlighted was high complexity with too many SKUs. Anything that you want to highlight on that front and work that has been done so far? Yeah, no, I mean, listen, complexity is there in the. I mean, I said that you know one of the the strengths of the organization is innovation and R&D and our ability to do, drive new products. And I hope I can speak about a few of them next quarter. And one of our weaknesses is complexity. And complexity is in SKUs, but in many other areas. I mean, let me give you an example of AIR, right, which is the, the communication that we have done, which is when guests come home, you should have AIR. And maybe at some point, we can send it across to all of you, the communication. We've done exactly the same communication with no changes in Indonesia, India, and Bahasa. Now, that's a reduction in complexity, right? Because two people were working on it, two advertising agencies were working on it, two people were producing the film. I mean, it's just an illustrative example of reduction of complexity. So SKU complexity reduction is on, and it is, uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing process and a pretty sharp one at that. But there are many areas of complexity like this one where when the same advertising works across the world, why spend money and you know complicate life by having different things? So uh, there's very much a war on uh, complexity and simplification that is going on uh, across for us. Very clear. Thanks, Sudhir. Thank, Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avi Mehta from Macquarie. Please go ahead. 
I uh, I just wanted to clarify, you know, just on the near term margin bit, and if I heard you correctly on FY23, you are essentially are. Would it be fair to argue for a pickup in the second half at the EBITDA level? Uh, but that would mean that the earlier comments of sequential EBITDA margin expansion is no longer valid. Was that the correct read to from your statement? No, I think what I said, and I think Samir will clarify, is that. If cost, even if we're conservative with costs, we expect some slight margin improvement in FY23 over FY22. And if we, if costs go to where we hope or where we think they will go to, it may even be better than that. But that is well, that's what I read out. Samir, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's a clarification. Of it. So you know, there will be a light path. I mean, the very short term. I mean, just because of uh, severe commodity inflation, there will be you know kind of margin pressure. And by the way, we will continue to invest for growth. So what? I mean, we will also see is, you know, upfront marketing investments for a lot of category development initiatives. But at this point in time, with all the assumptions, uh, even including on commodity, we do believe that uh, FY23 should see, you know, margins expansion. But again, as Sujit mentioned, the entire focus will be on, you know, sustainable UVG uh, during the course of the year. But yeah, I mean, at this point in time, we do believe that um, there should be margin expansion in FY23. Perfect. And just the other bit on Indonesia, uh, would it be uh, also correct to argue that the margin trajectory would mirror the sales trajectory, i.e. when the sales growth comes back in third quarter, uh, margins should also move back to the pre-COVID levels? I think so. I think that's what will happen. Uh, as I told you, it may take uh, two quarters because the, the economy, I mean, CPG did contract for two years and then, you know, there, there are consequences of contraction, but yes, I anticipate there too. Uh, both because of judicious price increases there as well, and because when you know growth comes back, we get back our uh, leverage. Leverage point. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Uh, I look forward to hearing on the HI side in the next quarter. Thank you. Thanks, Arvind. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jay Kumar Doshi from Kotak. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks for the opportunity. In the opening remarks, uh, you mentioned that you expect uh, palm oil prices to correct by 7 8% and maybe further, uh, you know, also. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Do you have visibility on uh, the output or supply that will come uh, starting June from Indonesia? And if Russia, Ukraine, uh, you know, conflict continues for a longer period and then su the supplies from those market of other, other edible oils, uh, you know, if there is a, uh, if that situation continues, do you still feel that palm oil prices will correct uh, by June or September? See, in the palm oil case, there have been two underlying, three underlying drivers of price hike. One is even pre-Ukraine, there was a, a supply-demand mismatch, which I think will correct, and I think is correcting. Two is that there has been the Ukraine crisis and sunflower oil from Ukraine, and three is that the Indonesian ban has further uh, exacerbated the situation. Of these three, we are hoping two will correct. The third one, if it corrects at some point in time, we will get a further upside. But at least two of the, one of the three seems to have been corrected already uh, from what, I didn't know this, but someone just mentioned that Indonesia has lifted it. So some slight relief will come there. And I think uh, in May, June, we're anticipating crop and all. So, so of course, the soy, the, the sunflower, Pressure continues to be there on Ukraine. If that happens, then we will it will it will go down to uh, you know levels we hope for. But we're not planning for that. We we think that even somewhere in between that we'll still be able to eat through. At this point of time, do you have visibility of the crop that will uh, you know from Indonesia, Malaysia starting June of the new crop? No, no, we not at this point in time. But I think all the only indicators are that there should not be, you know, I mean, supply side, you know, kind of issue, at least from crop plantation, you know, front. So essentially, the demand supply mismatch that we saw for two consecutive years, hopefully, should not continue in the following year. I mean, that's the thinking at this point in time. But I mean, it's not just in isolation the palm oil; it's also, I mean, the sunflower oil, right? So there are a lot of linkages. Correct. Uh, you know, to it. So yeah, let's see how it goes ahead. But I mean, if this Ukraine conflict gets resolved, um, then definitely there will be you know further uh, you know fall in palm oil prices is the hypothesis which we have. Let's see. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gaurang Kakad from Hightong Securities. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so, couple of questions. Uh, firstly, on the India business, uh, if you can uh, share some color in uh, between uh, rural and urban growth uh, as to how uh, it is currently panning out. Yeah, so I think if you look at uh, urban, including alternate channels, the growth has been nearly 1.5x. You know, I mean, of rural, you know, for us. Um, but directionally, we have seen, I mean, because we are relatively under-indexed in rural, our rural growth have been, you know, on the higher side. I mean, in terms of demand trends, it feels like more of the same. I mean, we had called it out last quarter also that even if you look at two-year CAGRs and those trends, nothing much has changed, I mean, between, you know, both the markets. Okay. Uh, yeah. And secondly, uh, in terms of uh, the Africa business uh, margin, uh, so you called out uh, the reasons uh, for uh, the margin fall. So, so leaving aside the one-offs, um, uh, the two factors largely RM inflation as well as upfront uh, marketing spends uh, uh, impacting margins by around 600 bits. Uh, so, so largely for the Africa margins, we had an earlier guidance of uh, margins um, as given in FY21 uh, going to around, say, 17-18% uh, uh, in the next four to five years. So largely, if you look at margins, uh, say, uh, this year also margins are largely uh, likely to remain in this 11 odd percent kind of a range. Uh, so then, uh, do we stick to that guidance of uh, 500, 600 basis points improvement uh, in the next two, three years? And what gives us the confidence for that? Yeah, I mean, that's the game plan and nothing much has changed, you know, on that thinking. Uh, there could be a year, you know, plus minus in that, you know, journey. Uh, as we have called out earlier, I mean, you know, better, you know, favorable category mix, scale play. I mean, uh, even, I mean, you know, a very sharp, you know, kind of control on wasted cost is all what we think should, you know, aggregate to you know, this margin expansion or better, you know, kind of rupees in Africa over a period of time? No, I think this year also, while this quarter has been exceptional, both because of the one-time loss and because of commodity in Africa business also, by the way, is very crude linked because our dry hair business is, uh, you know, plastic. The This year we have had margin expansion of about 100 bits. On a full year basis. On a full year basis. Yeah. So, you know, that journey of 100, 150 bits a year, even this year, despite the last quarter we are on, and uh, I mean, this quarter was exceptional both for the pilferage and for the cost increase. So, that kind of uh, margin improvement, 100 to 150 bits a year for the next uh, four or five years, we anticipate it will continue like it has in FY22. Right. Uh, thanks. So, so all those uh, like uh, uh, strategy in terms of uh, the four five year guidance of uh, say premiumization, product mix improvement, cost efficiencies, largely those are on track. And you think uh, you can achieve those margins uh, uh, in FY twenty six twenty seven? Largely a year or uh, year or miss is fine, but largely we are on track in terms of uh, the guidance. I think so. I think it was a quarter miss of Q four. I think we were on uh, on on track to kind of you know steadily increase margins in the business to achieve the kind of numbers you're talking about. Sure, uh, uh, that helps. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Avnish Roy from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, I should uh, a few follow-up questions. So, first is on e-commerce in India. So, we have seen uh, HUL now, for example, get 20% uh, of business uh, digitally and from e-commerce, 7 to 8%. And uh, many companies are getting that. So, where did you uh, set DCPL in this? And could you also talk about quick uh, e-commerce? How are you placed there? Are you getting some benefits from there? And how do you set uh, DCPL's presence in e-commerce for some of your larger competitors? Yeah, I think on e-commerce, the right way to look at it is not just about salience of our uh, in e-commerce and what is e-commerce salience. I think there are two or three measures that we look at. One is our share within e-commerce, which we're happy with. Two is our findability, you know, on uh, when, when people search for our categories, and we're quite happy with that. And three is that it must be accretive in terms of margins to our portfolio, which we think there's still work to be done on. That's how I would look at e-commerce. So I think rather than just worry about a salience as a number and just under all circumstances increasing it, I think like in any other channel, one has to be a, take a balanced view of, uh, of e-commerce. And of course, it's a rapidly growing channel and we are participating and, and our shares are, are good there. So we're quite happy with where we are, but that's how we look at it. Quick commerce is doing really well. 
I mean, uh, in the recent past, and in general, quick commerce definitely benefits uh, short tail, you know, because people, you know, quick commerce inventory is led to be limited to the winners in the category and in all the categories that we operate in, we are either number one or number two. So we are certainly from a consumer point of view, what I've heard from consumers is that they're very happy with uh, quick commerce. So we'll have to wait and watch, Avish. I think the way we'll have to look at any channel is, as and when a channel emerges, we have to resource for it and make sure that we get fair share within that channel and at the right profitability, right? And I think that, and, and, and resource for it, and then let the channel emerge after all. We don't play a role really in the development of the channel. Right. right. Uh, my second question is uh, on the uh, changes which have happened at the senior leadership uh, level. In the last three years, uh, if I see Africa business, uh, business head came from uh, Nestle, we saw remarkable improvement uh, once he came. Now in Indonesia, AX, Unilever, X, HUL guy is joining. Uh, Sudhir himself, uh, obviously, from HUL. And now the tech head also from a uh, good MNC experience. So my question is, uh, is there any cultural issue which arises from all these uh, uh, very senior appointments? Uh, because all these appointments are from lateral. So uh, is, how are you addressing if any uh, cultural issue is there? And uh, are most of the senior level appointments done or uh, you think in the next one to two years? I'm not asking for any guidance, but just wanted to understand, is the team now in place? I think, uh, thank you for that question. So I think uh, if we, you know, there's also been a lot of promotions from people internally also. So I just want to, uh, you know, put that out. So maybe recently taken over CFO. There's a number of senior people who, you know, are doing bigger roles after Sudhi came in. I think our philosophy has been that as much as possible, um, you know, that we'll have people internally take roles, but where where we do not have someone or we want particular expertise, say like in this digital transformation, we will go outside. You know, I think when we select people, we do select them for a cultural and value fit because otherwise at senior levels, it's very hard for them to come in and operate. So, you know, I, I know you do see Sudhir as from HUL or Dhanesh from Nestle, but, you know, we do see them as the individual they are and how will they not just fit into Gojit's culture, but improve it and uh, make it stronger. So I don't think uh, this cultural fit will be uh, an issue. And I think one strong thing that I've always felt about Goodridge is that uh, we are relatively humble uh, people and always willing to change and uh, change and get better. So I think this new talent coming in will be a good uh, refresh. I think we went through this a decade ago you know, at that time also we had very good high growth and, you know, company did well. And I think it's time now, uh, you know, to strengthen the leadership uh, team. But, you know, there's equally a number of people who are um, from within the company also. So, uh, thanks. Just one last follow-up on the Indonesia leadership. Uh, so, when uh, uh, Africa uh, business had change had happened, uh, within very short time, we saw a remarkable improvement in the margins and sales growth both. And obviously, he took a lot of corrective action in the marketing campaigns, more effective. Uh, similarly, in terms of distribution, he did a lot of changes, uh, more deeper distribution, and a lot of analytics usage, etc. So in Indonesia, Indonesia, when you're getting this person from Unilever HUL background, uh, is a similar uh, potential available here, or already most of these things are well run in Indonesia, so that uh, uh, the opportunity is not available. I'm not asking on margins or numbers, I'm just asking on the business side, is there a lot of uh, headroom to improve immediately? No, Abhish, I think, you know, both uh, Dharnesh and now Rajesh are both top class professionals and contribute, but very often these have their own dynamics uh, going on in the market, you know, which are ups and downs. I, I think what suffice it to say that you know, these things have to be looked at in the medium term and short term is not the right way to look at it. Somebody comes and, you know, puts things right and it starts growing immediately. That rarely happens, actually. 
So I, I would definitely say that I, I'm anticipating and hoping that the Indonesian business in, uh, in the medium term does really well under Rajesh's leadership, just as Guam has done under the nation. Okay, that's all for my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aniket Sethi from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Sudhir, if, if you can discuss the thought process on divestment of the blood. Uh, if, if I recollect, the company always had ambition in, in fashion and premium hair color. Uh, is, it, is it part of the business simplification process? And uh, what are the current ambitions for, for premium, premium hair color going forward? Yeah, no, I mean, look, you know, Vibrant's a great brand and uh, it's got a great consumer franchise. I think we have, you know, as I we articulated, a drive towards simplification and the core of our business and getting, you know, and, and most of that is market development of some of the categories, right? So in that, we felt that the home for Vibrant was probably better somewhere else. So... It's just the set of choices that we make. And if you were to ask me, while of course there are examples of premiumization like in Africa, in general, I would say that GCPL over the next few years should focus on category development. That's where the biggest bang for the buck is. And that's really where our focus is. And I'm not sure B-Blunt was a, a driver of category development of hair color or hair. And, and will we focus on, on the premium part in India, uh, let's say in, in the next two to three years? I mean, look, you know, we have some premium brands like, you know, Synthol and Soaps is a premium brand, but I would still say it's premium products in the category. We do have premium products, but I, I would still say that, you know, some companies, and it's, you know, it's difficult for me to simplify this into like one word, but some companies have this, you know, primary task of premiumization. I think our primary task is category development. Yeah. That's that's helpful. Uh, second, a small clarification. In the in the presentation, it's mentioned that you are gaining shares in in about eighty five percent of the categories for the India business. So, which which exactly were the areas where where you have lost some share? I think I mentioned that liquid detergents, mainly because of the definition of liquid detergents, because we are easy as uh, uh, you know, is basically a special yes. liquid detergent, and it's classified in all of liquid detergents. That is going to continue because, um, you know, there's a big movement in main wash to move from powders to liquid and easy doesn't really participate in main wash uh, in, in detergents. I understand. That's, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jitendra Arora from ICICA Prudential. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, just a couple of questions from my side. One, uh, as you alluded to, Africa margins improving on a yearly basis uh, and uh, not being worried about the quarter. Assuming the crude uh, stays where we are, uh, we expect uh, a bit the margins, uh, uh, margins in Africa to continue to improve for, for FY23. That's first. Second, uh, on the palm oil, you alluded to three uh, reasons why uh, there has been a spike. Uh, so obviously, second and third is something uh, which is event-based and temporary, which is essentially uh, your uh, Ukraine situation or uh, 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 what happened in Indonesia in terms of ban. So I, I wouldn't uh, worry about that, uh, honestly, because uh, there is very little we can do uh, uh, or uh, take it into consideration over a longer period of time. How about the first one, which is essentially the demand supply? Uh, uh, there is a increasing blend of palm oil in Indonesia uh, with uh, uh, the crude uh, or uh, for their domestic uh, fuel requirement, which has uh, affected uh, the uh, demand supply equation uh, in the market over the last few years, and that has led to the tightness. How do you see that resolving? Do you see uh, incremental supply from Indonesia to cater to that, or are you seeing any other geographic regions which will be stepping up supply uh, given that this new source of demand has been there? See, I mean, we, we are always working on blend flex and, you know, various oils and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, the the pre-Ukraine, pre-kind of Indonesia export ban, if you look at our India margins in Q4, they give you a good sense that we were, you know, on our way towards uh, solving that. And, you know, by next quarter, we would, or this quarter, we would have sorted that out. So even if there is a long-term supply demand gap in palm oil, 
you know our brands and generally soaps is a category which is a relatively small user of palm oil in the larger scheme of things should be able to manage i don't think uh, you know th this category is not going to be the one that gets massively affected by it it will be able to price up for it and uh, about africa i mean uh, in africa yeah I, as i said before i think we've seen actually despite a, i mean a q4 which was a one off i mean both in terms of cost and in terms of the pilferage you know we've seen margin improvements even in 2022 and we anticipate that to continue because again we are at a peak of oil prices already oil you know has fallen and so on and so forth in crude also so there also you know we can it's a bit like our soaps business we'll gradually take up prices and cover it up so i do anticipate some kind of moderate margin improvements in um, africa as well if if the commodity plays out the way we think it will play out if there's a further shock and all you know none of us know in the volatile world we're living in what i would say other things being equal we will continue the journey that we've actually started in fy22 so uh, essentially what we are saying is that there are enough price actions in place which will ensure that uh, Uh, the current commodity costs are passed on. I mean, certainly it is our intention to improve our margins in Africa, and uh, we are going to work towards that. It is not our intention to uh, and to go to the numbers that I think we alluded to in the next few years, uh, which is 17, 18, every dark kind of thing. Now, that's certainly our objective, and I think we've been, with this exception of the previous quarter, we've generally been quite successful also at it. So, sure. thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Priyam Daga from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I need some clarification on the market share side of it. Uh, so, uh, in, on an industry-wide basis, uh, some companies have lost uh, big growth or have have had big growth uh, in the European quarter case segment, and we have had a strong uh, personal care growth this quarter. So, is it fair to assume that we've kind of gained some market share from some of the organised players? I mean, if 85% of our business is gaining on a match basis, uh, you know, we have gained. Uh, we have certainly gained. I mean, certainly in soaps, they're doing very well in terms of market share. Okay, thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I now hand the conference over to Mr. Pratik for his closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thanks, everyone, for joining the call. If you have any further questions, to reach out to the IR team. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of ICICI Securities Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines.